Topic note 6.5, mangrove forests. This is a picture looking up underneath a red mangrove, and it just shows you the complexity that these trees have, and that's what's really awesome about them. They provide so much habitat. So let's get in a little closer and learn all about it. Let's look at the main ideas here. Mangroves have adaptations for surviving in environments where they are partly submerged in salt water. They grow on muddy shores in tropical and subtropical regions and have a major influence on biodiversity. They are a great value to human coastal communities, although many human activities pose serious threats to mangrove forests. And of course, always remember to check out the individual learning goals. Let's get started. Mangrove is a general term used to describe a broad group of unrelated tropical and subtropical trees and shrubs that share the capacity to thrive in saline environments, essentially salt water, right? They're found between 25 and 25 degrees north and south latitude-wise, so that's the tropics and subtropics. There's more than 110 species, and they tend to be incredibly diverse, especially in India. They can cover up to 75% of the coastline in tropical regions globally. They are considered facultative halophytes, which essentially means that they don't have to grow in salt water. They can grow in freshwater just as well, but they tend to be outcompeted in those freshwater habitats by other freshwater plants. So they're really, their niche is really taking that saltwater environment. Now let's focus on the conditions for the formation of a mangrove forest. Now mangroves grow in saltwater areas with some tidal ranges. They also grow in areas where there's more deposition than erosion. This is where you see a lot more sandy and muddy uh, shorelines and or um, substrate. This allows uh, mangrove propagules, for example, to embed in the sand and not take root. You know, it's a very calm area. There's not a lot of wave action, things like that. Now, they do grow in warm to mild temperatures year round. So they generally below 20 degrees Celsius, you're not going to find mangroves. In fact, here in Florida, as you go farther north, you will start to transition from mangrove shorelines to uh, salt marsh shoreline uh, because the temperature gets too cold. Um, they are often found in areas with offshore coral reefs because coral reefs provide a first buffer for wave action, allowing you to have a more calm uh, shoreline for mangrove development. Now let's take a look at the mangroves here in South Florida. Now, of course, the most prominent would be the red mangrove, Rhizophora mangle. And this one has very broad waxy leaves that terminate with a bit of a point. Um, they also have prop roots and drop roots. Prop roots come from the trunk and drop roots from the branches. And these create complex structures like you saw in that first picture at the beginning of the, the note set and of course this picture as well. And this picture that you see here is a low tide, but as tide comes up, water inundates within those prop and drop roots and provides areas for fish and other invertebrates to hide. Um, this also provides stability by trapping sediments. Now, they also have these long cigar-shaped propagules, which we're going to get into here in just a minute, and they are found along the shoreline reaching out into the water. They're often called walking trees here just because of the way those uh, prop and drop roots sort of reach out and eventually the tree starts to move towards and out into the water. Next up, we have the black mangrove, and the black mangrove has these more elliptical leaves that are often encrusted in salt, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, they have bark that's sort of dark and scaly, hence the name, and they produce what we call nematophores, or these little aerial roots or snorkel roots, if you will, that help keep the tree um, healthy in these anoxic sediments, so it's sort of like their ability to get gas exchange. Um, and when you see the nematophores in an area, which, by the way, there's also another name for them, we call them dead men's fingers uh, coming out of the sword. But when you see them, you know there's a black mangrove around. Uh, they are typically found behind red mangroves and can handle higher salinity. And you might think that's a little weird. Well, they're a little bit farther away from the water or at least secondary to red mangroves. But here's the deal. As tides come in and inundate them and then go back out again, some of the salt water left in the soil, the water evaporates and the soil gets saltier and saltier. So that's where they're able to handle that salt a little better. 
Now farthest back from the water, we generally have the white mangroves. Now these are broad rounded leaves with two glands at the base and they're sort of nectaries. So there's that. They, and again, like I said, they're found a little farther back. They don't have those brop and trop roots. They don't have nematophores. They kind of look a little bit more like trees, um, but they are part of the mangrove landscape. Now here's a graphic on mangrove zonation here in Florida, and there is zonation in different parts of the world as well. Um, the key thing to remember is this zonation is not clear cut. You will often find red and black sort of mixed at the same level sometimes, but it's a generalized sequence. Essentially towards the water, you're going to have your red mangroves. That's where they have a lot of flushing. And this has to do with salt uh, tolerance and the ability to deal with salt in different ways, which we'll get into here in the adaptations in a minute. As you move inland, you'll see the black mangroves and then eventually the white. But again, the whites can kind of intermix with the blacks and so on and so forth. So there's sort of a, a, a back and forth that goes there. So this zonation is just a generalized one and it's sometimes different depending on the situation that you find them in. Mangroves have a range of adaptations to help deal with these saltwater environments that we're talking about here. Now we're going to primarily be focusing on red mangrove adaptations, although I'll give you a few anecdotes for some of the others as well. Now we'll start with the idea of stability. Now the prop roots help to provide stability in the soft sediments. Remember mangroves are, are living in these kind of protected shelter areas so you have a lot more sedimentation so a lot more sandy and muddy shores so these prop and drop roots really help to stabilize them and they also in turn help stabilize sediments so it goes both ways. Oxygen absorption is another issue. The substrate is flooded and that means it has very little oxygen. So the prop roots provide access to oxygen for cellular respiration through the formation of lenticels, which are raised pores in the roots of a mangrove that allow gas exchange between the atmosphere and the internal tissues. Well, living in salt water, red mangroves definitely have to deal with salt. And one of the ways they do it is through what we call salt exclusion. The roots are nearly impenetrable to salt due to an efficient filtration system up to 97% of salt are what we call excluded um, from entering the actual mangrove itself. Now, the remaining salt is concentrated in leaves which are discarded as sacrificial leaves. Now, this is a um, metabolically expensive process to do all that filtering. Other mangroves don't necessarily do that. For example, the black mangrove just simply excludes takes the salt in and excretes it on the underside of the leaves. In fact, if you flip to the back of a black mangrove leaf, you can see all the salt crystals on it. And some people like to lick them and such <laughs> to taste the salt. Um, but that's the difference. There are essentially mangroves that are salt excluders like the red mangrove and others that are salt extruders like the black mangrove. When we talk about mangrove reproduction, uh, red mangroves are viviparous, and this means that a reproductive strategy where the seed develops into a young plant while still attached to the parent plant. Um, this works out really well for a lot of the mangroves, specifically red mangroves. The parents produce flowers which are fertilized to produce seeds, and then the seeds continue to grow into a propagule while still attached to the parent plant. And you can see in the diagram to the right there um, where the mangrove has these propagules hanging off of it. Now they can be broken down into the fruit and the radical. Now the radical is the first part of the seedling, essentially a growing plant embryo to emerge from the seed during the process of germination. So they get longer and longer, sort of cigar shaped in the case of uh, the red mangroves. So let's just define propagule here. It's a reproductive structure that detaches from the parent plant and is able to grow into a new individual. Now, once large enough, the propagule drops from the parent plant and then it's dispersed by water and currents. It just floats along uh, as it goes. Now, they are what we call obligate dispersals, meaning they must be in the water for at least 40 days while still developing before they are ready to actually um, take root. Propagules then stand in the mud, if you will, uh, and they are kind of balanced that way. So their tops float up and their bottoms float down um, for about additional 15 days. And then primary roots then start to 
develop and then eventually leaves and then you get the little baby mangrove uh mangrove propagules are able to develop a year after falling from the parent plant so even though it's like the obligate dispersal of about 40 days they can actually go quite a long uh time as well and this allows for very long dispersal when you talk about you know geographic regions and relatively low mortality rates the ecological importance of mangrove forests cannot be overstated. Let's start with sediments and land building. So the roots not only protect and stabilize the mangrove, but they help protect and stabilize the shoreline from erosion by wave action. So storm surge, boats, anything like that that create waves, it helps to trap that sediment. This increases deposition of sediments within these shallow systems and thus eventually builds land seaward. So essentially we start developing additional land in these areas. This also provides filtration of fresh water that runs from land into the coastal estuaries, uh, soaking up nutrients before it hits the water. And it also prevents sediments from affecting the near nearby seagrasses and coral reef communities just offshore. In terms of productivities, mangroves are a keystone species, but they really uh, run a bit of a detrital system. Uh, they provide a large amount of detritus in the form of leaves that form the base of the food chain and also trapping carbon. So a lot of detritivores uh, and, and breaking down of that dead organic material underneath the mangrove roots is really what fuels this whole system. In terms of biodiversity, mangroves are crucial. They provide over 1,300 species of terrestrial marine species, things like uh, algae, fish, sponges, crabs, barnacles, and other crustaceans under the water. Above the water, you've got birds, mammals, land crabs, reptiles, and snails. It's just a bonanza of life. And if you add on to that, that a lot of these animals are juveniles. So they re these mangroves provide a nursery habitat for juveniles to protect them from predators. This includes a lot of commercially valuable species such as blue crabs, spotted sea trout, and red drum. Beyond just the local importance, mangrove forests are important to the climate as well. Mangrove forests act as a carbon sink. They hold up to four times as much carbon as tropical rainforests and add excess carbon to soil, over about 6 billion tons in mangrove soils alone. If you compare, for example, terrestrial versus mangrove forests, you can see right there where a lot of the mangroves store their carbon below ground, whereas terrestrial are above ground. And then you can look for one mangrove it adds up to about four different actual terrestrial trees. The one acre of either of the mangrove, seagrass, or salt marsh uh, habitats over there on the right, it shows you just how much carbon can be sequestered. So these habitats that are all really linked in the marine environment are very important globally. Beyond just ecological importance, we do have economic importance as well. First of all, for island and coastal communities, uh, and mangrove forests are really important for harvesting fish and other seafood, for timber and building homes and infrastructure, and also for burning fuel. Uh, they also help protect the shorelines, which is a huge thing. And if you look at the top two pictures, you'll notice that the one to the top left is a seawall and the one to the top right is a mangrove shoreline. Uh, Seawalls don't always hold up because they, as, as wave action and boats and anything else goes on, it sort of takes sand out from under the seawall and eventually it collapses. That does not happen with mangroves. Uh, now, they also act as a sponge for flood water, helping uh, take in some of that excess water. And of course, ecotourism is a huge thing as well. It also supports healthy coral reefs, supports commercial and recreational fishing, um, and mangrove-based tour tourism, including snorkeling, glass bottom boats, and so on and so forth. Ecosystem services in terms of mangroves are estimated to be somewhere around $200,000 per hectare of mangrove forest every year. 35% of the world's mangroves were destroyed between 1980 and 2000. That's a very big chunk. And here you can actually see a graph that depicts some of that 
process, uh, and actually a little bit after 2000, from 2001 to 2012. Um, and what I want you to notice is what countries are, are responsible for some of this as well. If you look at things like Asia, for example, that's the yellow area. So Asia is a huge area, of course, um, but they are really taking out quite a bit. Why is that? A lot of this has to do with inshore aquaculture, shrimp farming being one of the big ones. And you can see that on the, on the graph to the right. What are some of the different human activities that attribute to the destruction of mangroves? So we have some big issues here to work on globally to protect our mangroves. Climate change is a unique threat for mangrove communities because there's a, a bit of a flexibility in what happens. As sea level rises, um, it can actually flood or drown the current mangrove shorelines. Uh, but those shorelines don't necessarily stay where they are. If you look at the diagrams to the bottom right, the top one shows no change in sea level. The mangroves are pretty much where they are. But the bottom one shows that as uh, as the sea level rises, mangrove seaward margin erodes, meaning that those mangroves start to die off. But on the landward side, the margin of uh, mangroves starts to grow inland. Um, this is essentially a shift in the mangroves uh, moving inland as the sea level comes up. Now, there are other things that can affect mangroves, like changing precipitation and ocean current patterns that can alter salinity. There also could be an increase in storm strength, uh, which can cause erosion and damage in certain uh, in mangroves. And that's what you're seeing on the bottom left picture there from a previous hurricane here in Florida. Uh, also, increased temperature may actually increase productivity of mangroves. So it's a bit of a mixed bag as to what ends up happening, depending on all these variables. Now, over-harvesting of mangroves, essentially deforestation, is very much problematic, and this does happen a lot in tropical countries. Uh, so mangroves are now in a demand for charcoal, wood chips, and pulp for paper production. Storm damage can also be a problem with some of these coastal regions as well. Storms can just destroy miles of coastal mangrove forests and degrade coral reefs uh, due to them not being as strong and allowing more waves to come in and affect the mangroves. Uh, these strong waves can pull sediments from mangrove prop roots, washing them away, and essential nutrients wash away with that as well. Here are some aerial photographs of mangrove forests taken uh, before and after Hurricane Irma uh, that came through in Florida. And you can see how uh, devastated it looks, but notice that all that wood is still there. It's still sort of the same shape. That just odes to just how well the mangroves do help to retain some of those sediments and, and fight that storm surge damage, but it still can damage the, the mangroves themselves. And of course, last up we have is coastal development. Uh, the coastal development uh, leads to mangrove destruction and removal. And this is a big issue here in Florida, as well as a lot of other tropical regions with mangroves. Um, this is ebbed on a lot of times by development of tourist resorts, shrimp farming, which we mentioned before. Uh, also coastal pollution, agriculture runoff, and the illegal dumping can all contribute to this as well. The Lake Worth Lagoon has lost about 87% of its mangrove shoreline. Now we have a lot of programs actually looking at trying to restore those. And these pictures are actually from our lagoon lagoon and intercoastal waterways. Uh, it is now illegal to remove, destroy, or damage mangroves in the state of Florida. All right, and here are your learning goals and main ideas one more time. Uh, I hope you uh, learned something about mangroves along the way. It's a really important habitat. And until next time, keep exploring and keep learning.